question I got was uh, why is GI, what, where my force is constrained? Well, this is really my definition of the model. This is an operator with commute to the Hamiltonian, so it must have, uh, every state must have some eigenvalue of GI, uh, and I just picked it to be one. So this is my definition of the Hilbert space. Um, so this, you know, sometimes, what we're dealing with here is a gauge theory, and these are gauge fields, essentially, that we call the label of the link. There's no matter fields yet. We'll eventually add matter fields. And as we'll see, as the matter fields hop from site to site, they pick up some Arnold-Bohm phase factors. In this case, the phase factors are plus or minus one only. Uh, uh, and uh, those phase factors will be given by, by these sigmas. So that's what these are. And this is like a gauge. Uh, this is just simply, in some ways, uh, the gate invariant constraint, you think of it as gauge fixing if you wish. Uh, but yeah, that's the definition of the model I'm looking at. Only a, the Hilbert space is only defined this way. And then why did I put this? Well, if I take the statement all spins up, well that's the state with you know that's the perfect lattice. So everything is up, I don't draw anything, uh, and the flux is one to every plug n. Now if I hit GI on the state, uh, I flip the spins on these four sides, so this is uh, this is the side I, and now still flux is is still uh, plus one on every plug n. So I haven't done anything. This is just another state with the same energy, but it's not a state. Neither the original state nor this state is an allowed state because neither state is an eigenstate of GR. If I just took the all spins up and hit GI on it, I get a different state. I don't get the same state back. So how do I fix that? I just put in this factor. And now once you put this factor, and you use the fact that GI squared is 1, and all the GI commute with each other, uh, then this is obviously true. And, and so now this is an allowed state. Previously it was not an allowed state, because it did not obey this state. But after a while we, we forget about this. Don't worry about this too much, because you can always put these factors in and make things get very fluid. But we could do that explicitly for a while. So you have to do the same thing here too. You have to put these factors here, but I don't bother. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is not the actual state of particles of plus minus one. This state does not obey the I for one. But once I put factors like this in front, you can make it obey. So we won't worry about it. All right, so the, the, the most important statement I made was that in the limit when G is much, much smaller than K, there exist excitations, particle-like excitations, little lumps that move around, like any particle, which are fractionalized, meaning that it's just like the Laughlin quasi-particle. There's no gauge invariant local operator that you can write down, which creates just one. So when I flip a screen, I create two of them. Uh, and now I can move them apart. So this could be on the moon, this could be here. Uh, and this is sitting here, it's a perfectly good particle. But I can't just get rid of it. No matter what I do, I'll only change the number of particles modulo 2. So it's protected. It's topologically protected. It's there forever. Uh, if it's sufficiently far from some other part. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so that's the defining property of the space. And you can easily check that all these properties are true uh, to all orders in perturbation theory in G. If you do high order perturbation theory in G, this property will not disappear. It's there. It's a very robust property. Uh, of fractionalization or topological protection or uh, local operator, that local excitation that cannot be created by any local operator. It can only be created in pairs. Yes? Uh, gauge theory has a reasonable defined meaning. In what precise sense um, are you, you know, calling this a gauge theory? Well, this is, this is exactly a zinc to gauge theory because uh, it's got, there's a local symmetry, if you wish. So this GI operator generates a gauge transformation okay. uh, where it just flips the gauge field by minus one. Uh, and I haven't introduced matter fields yet. Once we introduce matter fields, it becomes. So just hold your question for a little while. Once we have matter fields, then you'll see it looks just like a gauge. Yeah, I guess the reason I ask is because the, uh, the first part of Hamiltonian looks like the uh, uh, last gauge theory of the packet. Yes. But the second part looks a little bit. Uh, yeah, so, so, that, so this theory. Uh, it's in a certain, it's a gauge where there's no time-dependent gauge transformation. So I'm working in a gauge where uh, some, I think it's called 
unitary gauge, where I don't allow the time-dependent gauge transformation. So GI is a time-independent gauge transformation, uh, which just flips the sign of all sigma z operators uh, on, on everything. So, so basically, G, uh, GI sigma z L G I is equal to plus or minus sigma z L, uh, depending on whether the link uh, is on the side I or not. Okay. Oh, are you saying that the second part of Hamilton actually comes from the time chart of the... Yeah, it's the kinetic energy term. Oh, yeah. They fix the gate. Okay. Yeah, if you write this in on a lattice, if you make time discrete, uh, then you can also write this uh, the sigma x term as a product of sigma z on the time bucket. Okay, but you write it in a time independent way, the sigma z, product of sigma z on a time bucket becomes a sigma x. This is the usual mapping in for the Ising model, you may know the transverse field Ising model in one dimension with sigma z and sigma x is like the ordinary Ising model in two dimensions, where the sigma x becomes a sigma z, sigma z term. Okay, I'm, I would go into that, I think that's discussed a little bit in the notes. I don't have time for <laughs> All right. So this is a fractionalized place with these pi flux excitations, which have lots of names, pi zones, <coughs> particles, and the torus cores. Uh, but they're really the simplest example, and the first example of something like a, a, a log one point All right. Um, so what about the other phase then? What about the other limit? So let's go to the other limit where Now draw a phase diagram as a function of, uh, let's say, g of um, k over g, and there are two phases. So here, on so k much smaller than g, I have fractionalization. Lots of minus ones plus in the ground state. 
and both of these properties are true to all orders in G over K, and just by that reasoning, you can, you can deduce that there must be a phase position. It cannot, it cannot meet smoothly, because these are very robust properties to all orders in perturbation. Now, of course, uh, I'm using a language here which is Morton. Uh, Wegener used a very different language, which I review in the notes, but I won't talk about it. He introduced the idea of what's called the Wilson loop operator, which should really be called the Wegener Wilson loop, where you take the product of sigma z uh, around the plaquette, so which he calls this W operator, which is a uh, product on some contour of sigma z L. Uh, and in this phase, W obeys the perimeter law, and here W obeys uh, the area law. Okay, so I'm just only mentioning this for historical reasons. I don't really want to use it, but that's how Wegener argued there must be a phase condition because there was a perimeter and area law for the Wilson loop operator. The Wegener Wegener Wilson loop operator. But I'm using more modern language with different arguments for phase condition. Uh, and so in Wegener's language, this would be the deconfined phase. And this would be the confined phase. Okay. Now there's yet another way to distribute the phase, so let me just mention that. And, and that's topology. Suppose I take this have a point and I put it on a torus. Then what happens? Uh, put it on a very large torus. Uh, so that's the new idea that came into physics around the 80s to try to distinguish phases by their response to topology of space in this case, not this. Uh, and, and what happens is you'll find that the response of these two phases to topology of space is very, very different. So there's some global, there's some kind of long-range order because they, they know about the global topology of space. Uh, even though in terms of spin correlation functions, Everything decays exponentially in both phases. Uh, so let's just talk about that here. So now you put this on a torus. So this, these two operators are not 
generated by the GI. You can't create them by the GI because the GI sit on the sides and you can take any product on the GI you want to never find this particular product, uh, which goes all the way around the torus. And now it's easy to check this also commutes with the Hamiltonian. So, so we also have the fact that these also commute. And it's also sometimes useful to define another set of operators, uh, which are defined on the direct lattice side. Uh, something like this. You pick a contour that goes on the direct lattice, like this, say. So this contour I'll call Cx bar, and similarly for Cy. And then I can define the operator as Wx, is part of on L, on to Cx bar. ZL, and similarly for WY. And now you can check that WX BY equals minus BY WX, and similarly WY DX is minus W and DX WY. So these anti commute. And the reason the anti commute is because uh, C bar X and CX uh, must intersect. bar x and cy must intersect an odd number of times. And when they intersect, then you get two operators, sigma x and sigma z, that's anti commute And similarly for the others. All right. However, these Wilson lines do not commute to the Hamiltonian. Uh, if they did, then this would be more of a trivial model. Uh, it's not equal. All right, but I have two new conserved laws in the course. So then I can ask, uh, what is the, what, so every ground state, every state must be an eigenstate of Vx and Vy, in addition to be an eigenstate of Gi. So what you'll find is that on this phase, uh, there are four ground states with a gap, and they are all different values of Vx and Vy, plus or minus one, uh, whereas here, the ground state has Vx equals of plus one. So let me write that here. We have four ground states with uh, Vx equals plus or minus one, Vy equals plus or minus one. So these are operators that begin to the Hamiltonian. And here I have a unique ground state. <coughs> we have Vx equals Vy. So, of course, when I make, make, make four ground states, they're not really exactly ground states. In only the limit of an infinitely large system, I have the same energy. But the energy approaches each other exponentially fast in system size, in this case. Whereas there, there's only one state, and all the other states are much higher in energy. Uh, so, so, how do we see this? Well, again, it's very easy to see this using this kind of perturbation here. So, let me just show you how you get the four ground states over here. Uh, for that, let's just take Actually, it doesn't. 
But eventually, when you go to a very high auto perturbation theory, you will notice that the flux, there's some, there's some very long plaquettes. So there's these very long plaquettes here, uh, which go all the way around the torus this way. So if I take some loop like this, all the way around, uh, and I take on this contour, so I call this contour uh, W on this contour part of sigma z, uh, that's equal to minus 1. So there's a very long, any contour that's topologically non-trivial that goes around the hole has flux minus 1. Now that's, is that going to cost me some energy? It is, so the energy cost of this state will be um, will appear at g over k uh, to the power L. So L is, you have to look for the equation theory in all of these bonds all the way across the torus. But L is the length, so this, this is uh, this, this length of the torus is L. So it's very small, but G is smaller than K. So it's practically G. So that's that's the point that you can uh, uh, you get flux through the holes of the torus, and that's the topological order and what's responsible for the degeneracy. Now, uh, one thing I forgot to say: nothing depends on the shape of these contours, and you can pick any contour you want. Yeah. And the reason nothing depends on the shape of the contours is because of the GI. If you take the GI, you can see the effect of the GI is just to move the contour. Suppose I well, I take this contour for BY, and I hit GI here. If I hit GI here, this contour just moves like this. So the contours move around, so the GI always just moves the contours around. So you can take any contour you want, uh, because the GI is always there for you to move them around. Uh, and that's another aspect of the topology. So in fact, this ground state model manifold describes a topological point of view theory, which can be rewritten as a chern simons gauge theory. And that's written in the notes, but I won't talk about it. OK. All right, so I think that's all I want to say about the zeta gauge theory on its own, as defined by Baker, interpreted in a modern language. It has a topological phase condition, which depending on who you talk to, you get different descriptions. Uh, one description is the presence of m particles here and no m particles there. Or in terms of the ground state, this is like a Meissner state, where all flux is expelled. And here, flux is not expelled, but flux is fluctuating in the ground state. Uh, the old way of talking about area law versus perimeter law, we can find what is confined. I haven't explained these, so. We won't need that. And then the most modern way is, of course, the degeneracy on a torus, uh, which, is, uh, which is this here. In fact, my favorite is this, because it's the most general. Uh, even this becomes a little tricky when you're talking about systems which have Fermi surfaces, which have gapless states. Then this doesn't quite work, although it does work in some level. Uh, this is by far the most general way of thinking about this fractionalization idea and the presence of operators that are, cannot be created, presence of states that cannot be created by local operators. Yes? So the effect of the gradient velocity gradient is very similar to the second Sorry? V is a token, like a token uh, operator. So recently people have found many of these kind of operators. Yeah. And they sort of non-concentrated. Yes, you're right. So okay. Yeah, I think so. So this is the simplest one. Yeah, and uh, so this is, a, this is the set of commutation relation of the, uh, another way of saying it, of the Wilson loop operators, which is Simon gauge theory, uh, which K matrix is uh, 0, 2, 2, 0, something like that. It's a U1 plus U1 to the Simon gauge theory. And this uh, you know, uh, commutation relation of the Wilson loop operators. That's another way of thinking. Yeah, so there's many ways of thinking about it. Uh, this is all very so, so all of these different formulations really show you that this is you know very robust phenomenology. It's not that dependent on this particular Hamiltonian. Yeah. So the difference uh, between part code and this Hamiltonian, the second part of the uh, yes, um, yeah. Theory. So this one, it's really exactly the gate, uh, lead to gate theory. So tor code is not exactly a lead to gate, but some kind of deformation. Well, the toric code also has matter fields. It has static matter fields, which are not allowed to move. Those are the E particles. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, for my purposes, it's always in this phase. It's never there. Okay. The toric code always sits here. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you have to perturb the Tory code to get to the other side. Uh, so in the Tory code, this degeneracy is exact. The particles are, don't have any mass. Uh, particles are all infinitely heavy. Here, the particles have a mass. It has a phase relation, but of course, not exactly solvable. But it's quite easy to work out many things in perturbation theory on the two sides. Any other questions? All right, so to keep to my strategy, I'm still going to continue to talk about this for a little bit longer. I'm going to rewrite this theory uh, as a U1 gauge theory now. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the same water, but I'm going to rewrite it. Okay. Forget about the torus, forget about global topology. Uh, I'm going to introduce a result that would be important for me, uh, which originally due to Fratkin and Schenker from uh, I think 1979 or something like that, um, which is, I'm going to just think of it very differently, but it will be essentially the same. <coughs> Start looking more like anti <coughs> All right. So let's just consider just a single link. So on each link, so this is the link L. Um, I have two states. Uh, state up and state down. And I have an operator that flips between the states, sigma x, and every. Uh, here and there's two states up or down on that way. Okay. Just for the fun of it, I'm going to write down, take another Hamiltonian which has two degenerate ground states. So this Hamiltonian right now is this zero, which has two states. Now I'm going to have a non-trivial Hamiltonian which will have two degenerate ground states just on that way. So my Hamiltonian would be the following Hamiltonian. Uh, H will be some uh, minus. Um, d squared by d theta squared, some angle theta, uh, minus, uh, I forget what I called it, let's just call it j cosine 2 theta. So this is a Hamiltonian of a particle moving in a circle in a peculiar type of gravitational field. It's not cosine theta, it's, it's, so theta is a periodic variable. some fictitious particle or rotor that moves in a circle uh, and has a potential. The potential has a minimum at theta equals zero, but another minimum at theta equals pi. Okay? So if I, if I draw the potential from zero to pi, <coughs> then this potential, if I call this V of theta, Uh, and so only the important case of that. So it'd be very 
So mass has to be heavy. Uh, so then the tunneling will be very small, and the splitting will be small compared to everything else. Okay. So I want to just identify that uh, these two states here of this Hamiltonian with these two states of this rotor moving in this potential. Okay, just for fun. <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to do this on every link of the lattice and see what, 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 what happened here. So, in particular, what is the sigma z operator? Sigma z, I have these two states here up and down, which are split by this g. So, roughly speaking, I'm going to think of this minimum uh, as a spin r. And this minimum here as a spin down. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, the, the tunneling splitting here, the g, is somehow related to the tunneling amplitude that you can work out in the Hamiltonian and splits the energy of those two states. Now, if this is up, that means a, when theta is equal to pi, uh, that, so that I should call it down. And this is up. When theta is equal to zero, that's spin up, and theta is equal to mu pi, it's spin up. Okay. So if I look at this correspondence, then roughly speaking, sigma z is something like e to the i pi uh, e to the i theta. Because when theta is close to zero, I get plus one. When theta is close to pi, I get minus one. Okay. And so you can think of the g sigma x as some kind of kinetic energy operator of this. All right. So now let's put this on a on a map. Notation is kind of confusing. Uh, it's all in very carefully spelled out in the notes, so I refer you to the notation. I won't get all the fun signs right here. You have to take in i equal to plus or minus one, depending on. You have to give every link some orientation. I, I'm sorry, I won't get that right on the board. Please look up the notes. You have to give an orientation to each link. These are vectors that point in a given direction, and you have to carefully do that orientation. And that's what is the i factor. I'm sorry, that's all. Now the reason there is an orientation is 
use up if I take this term, if I take the product of sigma t on the paquette. So if I take uh, sigma z, sigma z, sigma z, sigma z around the paquette, uh, that turns out to be cosine uh, of the flux, where the flux is equal to basically the line integral of A without the uh, so, uh, here the discrete uh, is basically gives up orientation plus A1 plus A2 A3 A4 plus the sum of AI. So if you put the orientation right, what you'll find the product of sigma Z is consistently the <coughs> of the process. Uh, and there's a notation from that in case theory. You can write this as a discrete curl. So this thing we often write uh, as in the following way, equal to cosine of epsilon mu nu del nu a nu. So this is simply the statement. Del nu is a discrete derivative. So del nu of any function, uh, del nu of f sub i is just f plus i e mu minus f of i. So it's just a discrete derivative in the direction mu, so the unit length. So this may be take this minus this and this minus this and basically get the curl and that's why I write it in that case. Again, I refer you to the notes for the details of that thing, which I will never get out of the book. <laughs> Alright, so what we see here uh, is that this well, you know, now you see what I'm calling is the flux term, sigma z, sigma z, sigma z, sigma z. Uh, that's nothing but uh, cosine of the magnetic field. This is just the magnetic field pointing out of the board, so this is cosine of the field. And, and the other term, sigma x, is just e squared. So Hamiltonian is trying to look like e squared plus b squared, which is exactly the Hamiltonian of electromagnetism, with a few little caveats. Of so our new Hamiltonian, uh, what does it look like? So when the dust circles, you have the, these operators A and E on every link of the lattice, and the Hamiltonian uh, is sum of our plaquettes of some flux term, cosine of epsilon mu nu, del mu. This, that's exactly that term over there. Plus you have uh, someone L with some constant, E sub L squared. Now if you expand the cosine to second order, then this becomes B squared, and that's E squared. So that's exactly the <coughs> for uh, But there's one more term, which is this term, which I cannot forget. That's responsible for the Z2 gauge invariant. So that's minus J of some of all links of cosine of 2 A sub L. Okay. <laughs> Everyone happy up to this point? Uh, things are moving a little fast now. <laughs> uh, but really, I have not cheated. All the details are in the notes. Completely <laughs> explicit. Uh, in the approximation, I start with that Hamiltonian, and I, all I know is I take the Hamiltonian and I put a rotor on every link of the lattice. And the only approximation is I ignore the higher states of the rotor. I just take these two states of the rotor, corresponding to these two minima. That's all. And I take that, and I can rewrite the Hamiltonian this way. Okay. It's all that is completely nothing under the rug. All the steps are there. It's just hard to write them on the board. You can look for yourself and verify this. The notation is a little confusing, and I, I have only so much time, so I just write down the answer. All right, so this looks like a gauge theory, but this term looks kind of fishy. Uh, first of all, this, there's no gauge invariant. So okay, what would we want? So if you want a U1 gauge invariant, Uh, well, what we would want is that if I take 
take a mu uh, go to a mu minus d mu phi and the E is the electric field, E just goes to E. Uh, that under such a gauge transformation, the Hamel current should remain the same. Well, uh, this is true, so this is gauge invariant, because you can just check and take the terminal variance, so that's fine. But this term is not gauge invariant. It's only invariant if phi is equal to zero or pi, which makes sense. The original theory only had a Z2 gauge invariance. And this also only has a discrete gate invariance, which is zero or five. Okay. But we've got done all this work, and it seems like pointless to have only a discrete gate invariance. Why do all this work? If you're going to have a you want gauge invariance, you should really if you didn't have only a Z2 gate invariance, you go back to that. This is not any simpler. How is this going to help you? Well, you can however make things you want gauge invariant by uh, playing a trick, uh, which is again completely exact, it's a trick. And it seems to make things more complicated, but eventually it makes things simple. So the trick is to introduce another degree of freedom, some other phase, uh, which is going to sit over here. We're going to write this as uh, Yeah, so what we want to do uh, is make this term gauge invariant. So how can I make this term gauge invariant? Well, the only way I can make this term gauge invariant is if I introduce another phase, which I call, what did I call it here? Uh, capital theta. Capital theta i. Uh, I can't write capital theta, so let me write the, the okay, I'll try to write capital theta. Okay. It's not to confuse it with that thing. Okay, so I introduce another phase, uh, and then then I see that if theta theta i and capital theta i goes to capital theta i minus two phi i, then this term is gauge invariant. So just by hand put this term in, and now everything becomes gauge invariant. Now you will say, well, this is ridiculous. You make things gauge invariant by introducing a new degree of freedom. Well, yeah, that's right. However, you don't, you don't like to say you're very unhappy with this. You don't want to do this. I say, fine. You don't like this? Uh, just do a gauge transformation and put theta equal to zero. Choose phi. So you can, if I pick a theta, you can pick a phi so that the new theta is zero. You can always do that. So, and then you're back to the old theory. So in fact, introducing the new theory has changed nothing. Uh, because all other terms are gauge invariant, I can always do a gauge transformation to put theta equal to 0 and then back to the old theory. So by introducing this theory, when I do the partition function, all I've done is I'm summing over every state many times. Each time theta is a different value, I'm counting it again. So that's exactly the you know, summing over all the gauge transformations. So summing over the gauge transformation is perfectly fine because each gauge has the same physics. Okay? So just think about that. This is like, again a completely correct and precise statement with nothing under the rug. I can just introduce some degree of freedom which I call theta uh, and then make the thing gauge uh, And now just to give some theta some dynamics, uh, I can also add some uh, uh, kinetic energy term for the theta, uh, which I call n squared, uh, for some uh, time somewhat i, n sub i squared where n theta, um, theta also is in a circle, is again equal to i. So basically now I have a theory where there I have a rotor, a particle moving in a circle on every link, and I also have a particle moving in a circle on every site. The theta, this capital theta lives on the sites. So it's what we call a matter field. And this matter field, so this is a U1 gauge theory, more precisely, it's called a compact U1 gauge theory because A, everything lives on a circle. A lives on a circle, not on the line, like in an ordinary elect Maxwell electromagnetism. This is a compact U1 gauge theory where A lives on a circle, theta also lives on a circle, and these, these operators, E and N, have integer eigenvalues because of the angular momentum of particles that live on a circle. 
and integer eigenvalues. Uh, and the most important property here is back to two. <laughs> this two is telling you that this matter field has charge two under the U1 gate. And that two, of course, is very closely linked to the Z2 gate theory up there. So my claim is that this theory, which is a compact U1 gate theory with a charge two matter field, uh, has the same phases in the same phase diagram as the Z2 gate. <laughs> <laughs> and exactly the same gauge and properties, of course, is much, much harder to work with. <laughs> but for some purposes, it turns out to be quite useful. Okay, so, so this field, theta, with charge 2, uh, is we're going to call that the Higgs field. So Hi, the e to the i theta i, is the Higgs field. Okay, so this is a, a 
very well established route. You take this as like an XY model, uh, where you uh, uh, you know put on a lattice. So if you didn't have this term, this is just cosine rad theta, that's the XY model. So when you take the continuum limit, you just get the lambda visible theory of a complex scalar. Then by gradient variance, this term will just going to give you something like this. Okay, this is a good homework problem if you don't know how to go from here to there. Uh, any questions? So what I've shown you then, in fact, modulo this uh, this approximation, <coughs> the old gate division vector, is actually nothing but ordinary theory of superconductivity. <laughs> Where the heat field here of the superconducting auto parameter has charge two with respect to some dynamic electromagnetic fields. Uh, one very, you know, now, now you might say, well, that sounds really strange. I never talk about such things in my theory, my theory of superconductivity. Uh, yes? Um, why do you think that the high high voltage is Which one? Um, the second. No, here we are not really. We are taking the full because h is e to the i theta. So this this is this is just h squared. This term is just h squared. So this term I can write as h e to the i theta e to the i a h. So just expanding in h, and as long as I keep term for h squared, this is the only gating rate term I need to keep. Uh, as long as I do a continuum of it. But h. Uh, um, but there are no h uh, factor. Well, e to the i e to the i theta. This this thing is e, e to the i theta here on one side and e to the i theta on the other side. Right. This this thing here is uh, this is cosine of theta one minus theta two. If I want to take that term, it's the same as h one star h two. So if we didn't have this term, this is that's exactly that. Uh, and that's just do the gradient expansion between this term and this term. And, and these are just some soft spin, usual Landau Land Ginsburg theory for XY model, you just write it as a soft spin spatially average order graph. Okay, yes, there are a lot of steps here. <laughs> but I, I somehow assume that you've seen some basics of phase resistance, how you take it in the limit of that is discrete models, uh, and I'm just taking that limit over here. Okay. Actually, this is not really essential. If you're lost a little bit, don't worry. You won't really need this for the subsequent thinking. Okay. Now, so why does the ordinary length of Ginsburg theory look nothing like that to gate Well, there's two reasons. One is that we're all in, in the real world, E is uh, 1 over 137. Alpha is very small. Uh, so the effect of gauge fluctuations, quantum gauge fluctuations are very weak. And secondly, uh, ordinary electromagnetism is not cosine. It's, it's just that. So the flux is fully measurable. It's not measurable only modulo 2 pi. Uh, so this approximation is not made. And, and it'll turn out this is a very bad approximation for this theory. But we ignore that for now. All right, so now this theory, you know, if I just take the theory naively, this theory has been studied a great deal. Uh, this is just the Landau Ginsburg theory of superconductivity. And what do we know about the phases of this theory? Well, the phase of this theory also has two phases. There's the superconducting phase uh, and the other phase. Um, so this has as a function of S now. Has two phases. There's what we would now like to call the Higgs phase, H not equal to zero, and H equal to zero. So here the potential V of H, you know, looks something like this. There's a metric in half potential, and here V of H looks like this. And those are the two phases. Uh, and these are precisely the defined and the defined phases of the specification. Uh, and the way we know that, again, just go back to the 
basic definition. Is there some object here which does not exist over there, which cannot be created by any local operator? Yes, it's the abacus of vortex. And that's the analog of the pi plus. So as you learn in Hinko Landau theory, uh, there's a vortex solution. So as we go around the vortex, this is our space, so this is x and y, continuum space. As we go around the vortex, h goes to uh, h times 2i pi, uh, so which is the same as h. Uh, and then there's flux here, and the flux here, which is uh, d2x del cross a uh, is equal to pi. And the reason there's a pi flux for a 2 pi winding is, of course, this factor of 2, that as you learn in the optimal Landau theory. Uh, you need that because at long distances, then uh, this term vanishes as long as there's flux pi over here. So, uh, all right, so that's. Again, standard textbook things, and uh, I'm getting close to the end of my lecture, so this is explained in more detail in the notes, so we can read up on it. Uh, so, this is the object, this is the bison of the m particle of the vector gates here. There also, you had an object that carries plus pi. So, here you have an object that carries plus pi. It only makes sense in the superconducting state, which is a state of flux expulsion. Uh, and, uh, uh, it does make no sense in the normal state, which has lots of flux. It's flux penetration. So we have now mapped, at least roughly speaking, uh, the some aspects of the superconducting phase condition of Gibbs Landau theory to the Z2 gauge theory transformation uh, uh, phase condition I talked about earlier. So in some sense, even the superconducting theory is a topological phase condition. There's no global symmetry that's been broken. Now, we don't normally think of it as a topological condition uh, because we say it's a, global, it's a global symmetry broker. That's true because in the real world, for real superconductors, E is so tiny that you can forget about the fluctuation in the gauge field. And then it looks like a global symmetry. But in reality, even the superconducting phase condition has no global symmetry breaking because it's, there is some very weak coupling to a gauge field. Now, of course, for the Z2 gauge field, this is not small, this is 1, or even larger than 1, uh, and that's why we need to, we can't take that point of view, and this is really a topological condition. So, one last point I want to make. However, there's one very important difference between this superconducting theory uh, and the Z2 gauge theory. So, in the Z2 gauge theory, there's only one pi flux excitation. <coughs> Okay. 2 pi was nothing. 2 pi flux was nothing at all. Uh, there's only one pi flux object. If I take this theory, this is a single vortex. Uh, but you can also get, more generally, uh, a n fold vortex. So this is n, this is n pi. Okay. So in superconductivity, Also 
have to act with this monopole. So the full theory has monopoles, which change flux by 2 pi. Uh, and the monopoles have to be present for to, to complete the mapping from here to there. So you won't need that, so I don't know. But if you really want to, uh, for example, study the space condition. So the claim is that once you account for the monopoles, which carry flux 2 pi, so you always have tunneling events, you can change the flux by 2 pi. So if you have changed by flux by 2 pi, you can always jump from minus 1 to 1, or 1 to 3, and so on. They're all the same state, because you can tunnel freely between them. They have the same state, so you have to keep monopoles around. Uh, and once you take the monopoles into account, then this space condition is the same as the space condition in the vector C2 case here. Uh, that's in the notes. Uh, all right. Anyway, so that's the end of the story. And the, the point here was to show you uh, that this basic topological phase condition can also appear in some other theories which have much larger gauge groups, but which have some Higgs fields. Uh, and this is the trick that we're going to use to talk about the Hubbard model. We're going to take the Hubbard model and write it with a much larger gauge theory and introduce Higgs fields and, and then see all kinds of wonderful things happen, including phase condition that change the volume of the Fermi surface. Uh, but it's just a more complicated version of what I did today, uh, where I showed you two different gauge theories. And this gauge theory, written in the continuum, actually it's all up there. So this, that theory over there, the claim is, is the same as this theory, in the universality sense that all the phases of that theory, all the phase conditions of that theory are the same as the phases and phases of this theory. So they're exactly equal. When you take the continuum limit in some subtleties, uh, which are looking more hard, but it won't be important for anything I say. All right, thank you. Well, maybe I'll offer one or two questions.